Of the three outstanding U.S. Army Air Corps USAAC fighters of World War II, the others being the P-47 Thunderbolt and the P-51 Mustang, the P-38 was the first to fly by almost two and a half years. Built by the Lockheed Aircraft Company, it was designed to a 1937 specification calling for a high-altitude interceptor with heavy armament and a high rate of climb. Lockheed P-38 Lightning Circular Proposal X-608 was a set of aircraft performance goals authored by then First Lieutenants Benjamin S. Kelsey and Gordon P. Seville for a twin-engine high-altitude interceptor having the tactical mission of interception and attack of hostile aircraft at high altitude. Forty years later, Kelsey explained that he and Seville drew up the specification using the word interceptor as a way to bypass the inflexible USAAC requirement for pursued aircraft to carry no more than 500 pounds, 230 kilograms of armament, including ammunition, and to bypass the restriction of single-seat aircraft to one engine. Kelsey and Seville were looking for a minimum of 1,000 pounds, 450 kilograms of armament. They aimed to get a more capable fighter better at dogfighting and at high altitude combat. Specifications call for a maximum airspeed of at least 360 miles per hour, 580 kilometers per hour at altitude, and a climb to 20,000 feet, 6,100 meters, within six minutes. The toughest set of specifications USAAC had ever presented. No American engine then available produced sufficient power to satisfy the requirement so it had to be not one, but a pair of liquid-cooled inline Allison engines turbo-supercharged for high-altitude performance. The Lockheed design team, under the direction of Hal Hibbard and Clarence Kelly Johnson, considered a range of twin-engine configurations, including both engines in the central fuselage with push-pull propellers. The Lockheed team chose twin booms to accommodate the tail assembly, engines, and turbo-superchargers, with a central nacelle for the pilot and armament. The eventual configuration was rare in terms of contemporary fighter aircraft design. Clustering all the armament in the nose was unusual in U.S. aircraft, which typically used wing-mounted guns, with trajectories set up to crisscross at one or more points in a convergence zone. Nose-mounted guns did not suffer from having their useful ranges limited by pattern convergence, meaning that good pilots could shoot much farther. A Lightning could reliably hit targets at any range up to 1,000 yards, 910 meters, whereas the wing guns of other fighters were optimized for a specific range. The P-38 was the first American fighter to make extensive use of stainless steel and smooth, flush-riveted, butt-jointed aluminum skin panels. It was also the first military airplane to fly faster than 400 miles per hour, 640 kilometers per hour in level flight. Test Flights Lockheed won the competition on 23 June 1937. Construction began in July 1938, and the XP-38 first flew on 27 January 1939 at the hands of Ben Kelsey, losing this prototype in a crash at Mitchell Field, New York, with Kelsey at the controls did not deter USAAC from ordering 13 planes for service testing on April 27. Kelsey survived the crash and remained an important part of the Lightning program. Before the airplane could be declared ready for combat, Lockheed had to block the effects of high-speed aerodynamic compressibility and tail buffeting, and solve other problems discovered during the service tests. The most vexing difficulty was the loss of control in a dive caused by aerodynamic compressibility. During late spring 1941, USAAC Major Cigna A. Gilkey encountered serious trouble while diving his Lightning at high speed from an altitude of 30,000 feet, 9,120 meters, when he reached an indicated airspeed of about 320 miles per hour, 515 kilometers per hour. The airplane's tail began to shake violently, and the nose dropped until the dive was almost vertical. Gilkey recovered and landed safely and the tail buffet problem was soon resolved after Lockheed installed new fillets to improve airflow where the cockpit gondola joined the wing center section. Seventeen months passed before engineers began to determine what had caused the Lightning's nose to drop. 
They tested a scale model P-38 in the Ames Laboratory wind tunnel operated by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, and found that shock waves formed when airflow over the wing's leading edges reached transonic speeds. The nose drop and loss of control was never fully remedied, but Lockheed installed dive recovery flaps under each wing in 1944. These devices slowed the P-38 enough to allow the pilot to maintain control when diving at high speed. Allied Orders In March 1940, the French and the British, through the Anglo-French Purchasing Committee, ordered a total of 667 P-38s from the U.S., $100 million, designated Model 322F for the French and Model 322B for the British. The aircraft would be a variant of the P-38E. After the fall of France in June 1940, the British took over the entire order and gave the aircraft the service name Lightning. By June 1941, the War Ministry had cause to reconsider their earlier aircraft specifications based on experience gathered in the Battle of Britain and Luftwaffe Blitz, air raids and Great Britain actions. British displeasure with the Lockheed order came to the fore in July. On 5 August 1941, they modified the contract such that 143 aircraft would be delivered as previously ordered to be known as Lightning Mark I and 524 would be upgraded to U.S. standard P-38E specifications with a top speed of 415 miles per hour, 668 kilometers per hour, at 20,000 feet, 6,100 meters, guaranteed to be called Lightning II for British service. Later that summer, Royal Air Force test pilots reported back from Burbank with a poor assessment of the tail flutter situation and the British canceled all but three of the 143 Lightning Ones. These three P-38Es were transferred from the US AAC for service with the Royal Australian Air Force RAAF No. 1 Photographic Reconnaissance Unit. The first plane was received on 31 August 1942 and operated successfully until it was written off in a landing accident on 2 August 1944 at Coomalee Creek in Australia's Northern Territory. The second had a less spectacular career and operated only from 4 September 1942 to 18 December 1942, being phased out of service on the latter date. The third Lightning was received on 27 February 1943 and operated throughout the year until it was written off in a wheels-up landing on 10 December 1943. The P-38E was not actually designed as a photographic reconnaissance aircraft but circumstances caused it to be used in this role by the RAAF. Negotiations about delivery of other planes to Great Britain grew bitter and stalled, but after the 7 December 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, everything changed and the U.S. government seized some of 40 of the Model 322s for West Coast defense. Subsequently, starting in January 1942, all British Lightnings were delivered to the U.S. AAC Many of the 524 Lightning Ones ordered by the British were fitted with stronger F-10 Allison engines as they became available and all were given wing pylons for fuel tanks or bombs. The upgraded aircraft were deployed to the Pacific as US AAC F-5A reconnaissance or P-38G fighter models. One result of the failed British-French order was to give the aircraft its name. Lockheed had originally dubbed the aircraft Atlanta from Greek mythology in the company tradition of naming planes after mythological and celestial figures, but the RAF name Lightning won out. The first Lightning to see active service was the F-4 version, a P-38E in which the guns were replaced by four K-17 cameras. They joined the U.S. AAC 8th Photographic Squadron in Australia on 4 April 1942. Mediterranean Theater Early results in the Mediterranean theater of operations were mixed. Some P-38 pilots scored multiple kills to become aces, while many others were shot down due to inexperience or tactical strictures. Overall, the P-38 suffered its highest losses in the Mediterranean theater. The primary function of the P-38 in North Africa was to escort bombers, but the fighters also targeted transport aircraft, and later in the campaign, they were sometimes tasked with ground attack missions. When tied to bomber escort duties, the P-38 squadrons were vulnerable to attack from above by German fighters, 
which selected the most advantageous position and timing. The ineffectual early tactical doctrine of the American units required the P-38s to fly near the bombers at all times rather than to defend aggressively or to fly ahead and clear the airspace for the bombers, and many American pilots were downed because of this limitation. Losses mounted, and all available P-38s in Great Britain were flown to North Africa to restore squadron strength. After this painful experience, the American leadership changed tactics, and in February 1943, the P-38 was given free reign in its battles. On 5 April 1943, 26 P-38Fs claimed 31 enemy aircraft destroyed, helping to establish air superiority in the area and earning it the German nickname Der Gabelschwanzteufel, the Fork-Tailed Devil. German fighter pilot appraisal of the P-38 was mixed. Some observers dismissed the P-38 as an easy kill, while others gave it high praise, a deadly enemy worthy of respect. The P-38 performed usefully but suffered from a number of problems. Its Allison engines consistently threw rods, swallowed valves and fouled plugs, while their intercoolers often ruptured under sustained high boost and turbocharger regulators froze, sometimes causing catastrophic failures. Lightning pilot 2nd Lieutenant Jim Kunkel of the 370th Fighter Group remembered, the critical problem with us was we didn't have much heat in the cockpit. On high altitude missions, it was very cold and we didn't have the engine in front of us to help keep us warm. Bomber guys had those heated blue Union suits that we wore, but we tried heated clothing and it didn't work for us. The only source of heat in the cockpit was warm air ducted from the engines and it was little help. Lightning pilots suffered terribly. Their hands and feet became numb with cold and in some instances frostbitten. Not infrequently a pilot was so weakened by conditions that he had to be assisted out of the cockpit upon return. Pacific Theater The P-38 was used most extensively and successfully in the Pacific Theater, where it proved more suited, combining exceptional range with the reliability of two engines for long missions over water. The P-38 was used in a variety of roles, especially escorting bombers at altitudes of 18,000 to 25,000 feet, 5,500 to 7,600 meters. Freezing cockpit temperatures were not a problem at low altitude in the tropics. In fact, the cockpit was often too hot. Pilots taking low altitude assignments often flew stripped down to shorts, tennis shoes, and parachute. While the P-38 could not outturn the Mitsubishi A6M-0, and most other Japanese fighters when flying below 200 miles per hour. Its superior speed coupled with a good rate of climb meant that it could use energy tactics, making multiple high-speed passes at its target. In addition, its tightly grouped guns were even more deadly to lightly armored Japanese warplanes than to German aircraft. The concentrated parallel stream of bullets allowed aerial victory at much longer distances than fighters carrying wing guns. Dick Bong, the highest scoring U.S. World War II air race, 40 victories in P-38s, flew directly at his targets to ensure he hit them, in some cases flying through the debris of his target, and on one occasion colliding with an enemy aircraft that was claimed as a probable victory. The twin Allison engines performed admirably in the Pacific. Most of the top army aces in the Pacific flew lightnings. On 29 May 1942, 25 P-38s began operating in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. The fighter's long range made it well suited to the campaign over the almost 1,200-mile Long Island chain, and it was flown there for the rest of the war. The Aleutians were one of the most rugged environments available for testing the new aircraft under combat conditions. More lightnings were lost due to severe weather and other conditions than enemy action. There were cases where lightning pilots mesmerized by flying for hours over gray seas under gray skies, simply flew into the water. On 9 August 1942, two P-38Es of the 343rd Fighter Group, 11th Air Force, at the end of a 1,000-mile, 1,600-kilometer long-range patrol, happened upon a pair of Japanese Kawanishi H-6K Mavis flying boats and destroyed them, making them the first Japanese aircraft to be shot down by lightnings. On April 18, 1943, 14 P-38 pilots from the 70th and the 339th Fighter Squadrons, 347th Fighter Group, accomplished one of the most important lightning missions of the war. American ultra-cryptanalysts had decoded Japanese messages that revealed the timetable for a visit to the front 
by the commander of the Imperial Japanese Navy, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. This charismatic leader had crafted the plan to attack Pearl Harbor and Allied strategists believed his loss would severely cripple Japanese morale. The P-38 pilots flew 435 miles at heights of 10 to 50 feet, 3 to 15 meters, above the ocean to avoid detection. Over the coast of Bougainville, they intercepted a formation of two Mitsubishi G-4M Betty bombers carrying the Admiral and his staff, and six Mitsubishi A-6M Zeros providing escort. The Lightning pilots downed both bombers. The P-38 service record shows mixed results, which may reflect more on its employment than on flaws with the aircraft. As a World War II fighter, the Lightning's legacy is unmatched. A total of more than 10,000 P-38s, including 18 distinct models, were manufactured during the war, flying more than 130,000 missions in theaters around the world. P-38 pilots shot down more Japanese aircraft than any other fighter and, as a reconnaissance aircraft, obtained 90% of the aerial film captured over Europe. Perhaps test pilot Colonel Ben Kelsey summed up the Warbird's legacy best of all. That comfortable old cluck, he said, would fly like hell, fight like a wasp upstairs, and land like a butterfly. If you like these types of videos, subscribe to our channel and get notification when we release new episodes. For more interesting military history content, check out our video library.